Well, good morning. Oh, I know you got more in you. I heard you just worshiping. Good morning. All right, we're alive, awake, alert, enthusiastic today. Uh, we are in the house of God, and honestly, I'm excited to be able to share with you today. We have been in a collection of talks on the topic of worship. And before we can really kind of get into exactly what worship is, I think we need to define it. Because um, maybe we think about worship as what we just did. We just sang songs to God about him, to him, about how good he is. Um, or, or maybe we use that word and we think of worship as like what we talked about last week in Romans 12, 1, that um, worship is really our life and, and how we are living is our lifestyle. Um, and those things are true and accurate, but I want to give us a working definition for today, and that is this, that worship is wherever the attention of your mind and the affections of your heart most easily and consistently go, that is worship. So in other words, it's like, this is the thing that my heart is going after, that I am pursuing with all of my life, like that is worship. Or honestly, another way to define worship would be attributing ultimate worth to someone or something. So not real common, uh, probably in this room, is that you can worship the devil, or you can be tempted to worship something that is evil, and, and that's, that's a real thing. But I think that for most of us here today, the thing that um, can get in the way of us actually worshiping God is frequently actually the good gifts that God has given to us. So for us, we can begin to worship something like our job or to worship our success or to, to worship people's approval of us. Or it could even be that we begin to worship our spouse or we could worship our kids. Like that is the thing that, that is, that is everything to us. We can start to find our identity. Like it's how good of a dad I am. And so that becomes my actual heart's pursuit. And um, instead of maybe for us today is like, I want to worship God. And what worshiping God means is not that like I neglect my responsibilities or I'm not grateful for the gifts. But I think the first thing we have to do is start today is to just look inwardly and, and really assess ourselves. Like, what do I actually worship with my heart and with my life? I think it's a really, really important question and um, for, for us to be able to look at. But, but now we know what worship is, but then this, the next logical question would be, why do we actually worship? Like, why do we even do that thing? Like, why do we spend time with it? Is it that, you know, God is just this insecure being and he needs all of us to gather for an hour on Sunday mornings and going to prop him up with some songs? Probably not. That's, that's definitely not the case, if you were wondering. Um, God's not that. Um, so if that's not the case, and that's not who God is, then why do we worship? Why would we even take time to do this with our hearts and with our lives? Well, Scripture's got some really good and interesting things to say to us here today, and I'm, I'm praying and hoping that this will land and transform your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you have a Bible with you, um, you can open it up, or there's a Bible in the seat back in front of you, or we got it on the screen, or we got it on a Bible app. We got the Bible literally everywhere around here. Like, you need a Bible, we got you. So don't you worry. In fact, if you're a new guest, we got free Bibles at the Welcome Center. Just Bibles on Bibles around here. Okay, here is Isaiah chapter 6. Here is what it says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. 
your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. So the first thing we recognize is this is a bizarre worship experience. Like, I don't know about you, but I haven't been in a spot where like doorposts and thresholds are shaking and smoke is filling the room, like maybe a little hazer on the, on the stage for some, for some uh, fog or something like that to see the lights better. But I, I haven't been in an environment like that. But Isaiah is experiencing this, this supernatural experience with God. The other thing that we, we note right away is it, it starts off the passage as this, is in the year that King Uzziah died, And the thing about King Uzziah, he's an interesting person in and of himself that we could talk about for the rest of the morning. Um, His his life is actually chronicled in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. See what I did there? Didn't even mean to do that. Um, But that that happened. Okay, so, but if you uh, want to look up and find out more about him, he was a great king of Judah where, where Isaiah is at. And he actually started his reign as king at 16 years old. And I don't know about you, I, I, I got a lot of hope in our teenagers around here, but I don't know if they're quite ready to run the country uh, quite yet. Um, but that was the case for King Uzziah. He then reigned as an amazing, ama- one of the best kings ever in that, in that region, in that area, for 52 years. And now he comes to the end of his life, and he has passed. And this is where Isaiah is at when he is writing. And the thing I know about King's passing in the Middle East is that is not typically a time of peace. That would be a time often of chaos. Or maybe it would be a time for them of sadness. Their beloved king has passed away. But it's right in the midst of this king passing away where Isaiah is having this supernatural encounter with God. And I don't know about you, but for me, when I feel like my, my world is twirling out of control or I've got a big problem or, or I've got some deep sadness in my heart at, at the pain that is happening, maybe I've caused it or maybe it's just happening around me or in somebody else's life that I love. For me, it's typically harder for me in that time to experience God because for me, I get fixated on that thing and that's where my mind goes. Like that's, I'm focused on my problem. I'm focused on my situation. And so my first question becomes, how does Isaiah, in the midst of sadness and chaos, experience God? And the answer is quite simply, worship. Isaiah, check out verse number three. It says this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. Isaiah is in the midst of worship, in the midst of chaos, and the way that he is able to experience God is that he is worshiping him. Like that, that is what he is doing. Worship for each and every one of us here today. Worship allows us to experience God even in a chaotic season of our lives. Like, we don't have to push away God. We don't have to run away from God when we've got things going wrong or things are really tough. Like, we can still actually experience God. That's not just true for Isaiah. Why? Because God is the same, Hebrews says, Hebrews 13, yesterday, today, forever. God doesn't change. So, like, Isaiah had that experience. We can have that experience, too, that even in the midst of our own chaos— we can actually worship him. It's in that space where we do that, that our own hearts and our own lives can actually begin to be transformed. And I know in in a room like this, and and I've prayed with so many of you here today, that there is, there's some real heavy things. And and I know, like, I, I can't take that away. I can't change that. But, but I do know and I am grateful that we've got a God who does not leave us isolated and alone when we're in that space. He actually draws near to us. God's word says he is close and near to the brokenhearted. Man, I am grateful for a God like that. But so that is, that is one reason that we worship God is that we can actually experience him regardless of what's going on. But there's more to it. In verse number five, it says this, Isaiah writes, 
Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. So it's in the midst of worshiping God where Isaiah starts to look inwardly and he starts to realize how messed up he really is. He, like, he is worshiping the holy, holy, holy gods. And the reason it says holy, holy three times, holy, holy, holy three times, say that quick. Um, the reason it says that in, in Hebrew is really to, to really to establish that this, the holiness of God is infinite. It, it does not end. It goes on forever. And, and the thing of it is, is that for Isaiah, this is what it says in the New Living Translation. translation. Isaiah is saying, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. Like Isaiah is looking at his own heart in worship, and he thinks what he has done is unforgivable. Like he is just wrecked and ruined. A good way to unpack that word would be like, its life is unraveling. And so, you know, I, I start thinking about it, and I'm thinking, okay, so what did you do, Isaiah? Like, did you, did you kill somebody? Like, did you do something that's just horrible, horrible, horrible? And the thing that he lists out that he did, the big dark sin in his life, is that he is a man of unclean lips. I'm like, are you over, overreacting a little bit there, Isaiah? Like, I mean, that's not good. Like, did you, did you slip up with a swear word? Did you, maybe did you gossip about somebody? Like, that's not good. I'm not advocating for that, but I'm like, yeah, you're, you're freaking out here. And here's the thing is, I think for us, like, we think of the big sins, the big wrongs that we can do in our world that, that land you in jail for several years um, as, as being worse sins than other sins. But the truth is, is that God hates all sin. And the reason that God hates sin is that he knows that sin is what actually destroys our lives. It destroys our potential. It destroys our destiny. It destroys our calling. It leads us on a path of destruction. And so God does not hate us for being sinners. He hates the sin that divides us. Even when you think of something that it's like, well, gossip isn't good, but could it, you know, is it really that bad? Like sometimes I just want to tell that story that it just gets me that attention or, or I want to tell that joke that gets that laugh, even if it puts someone else down. And the thing that Isaiah is recognizing right here in the presence of God is he's saying, like, no, like, my lips can destroy. The thing about gossip, gossip drives a wedge between relationships. And relationship is what God is all about. God wants a relationship with you, and God wants us to have healthy relationships with one another. And what does gossip do? It puts up those walls, or it elevates us above somebody else. Whether we recognize we're doing that or not, it's what it does. And Isaiah recognizes this, and, he, and this is the thing about worship when he's worshiping God, is that worship exposes just how dark our sin can be. Like, we underestimate it. We don't think it's that bad. But it is. And and Isaiah realizes this. And even think about this. Isaiah's calling on his life was to be a prophet, was to go and speak to other people and to warn them about the dangers of where sin could take them. And think about this. If Isaiah doesn't spend time in the presence of God with him, and then he tries to walk out into his calling to go and speak to other people, think about this. If, if you were to walk in and say, hey, you guys need to repent because the way that you are gossiping about others, and da, da, well, think about this. If somebody comes to you and they're the person who does that all the time, do you listen to them? Like, no, the, the people there would have cried out to him and said, You're a hypocrite yourself. Like, what do you have to stand on there, Isaiah? So instead of putting him in that situation, God convicts him of his sin to to realize that and then to move him forward and to move him into his calling and his destiny. It's not just to to beat him down and to... No, that's not how God does it. God is not a God of condemnation. The book of Romans says there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Like, that's not how God works. He doesn't, he doesn't show us our sin to beat us up. He shows us our sin to protect us from where we were supposed to go in the first place. He wants to redirect our path towards his path. Now, the thing for Isaiah is he thinks at this moment, he says, my life is wrecked 
It is ruined. It is over. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to say Isaiah was wrong at this point. I want to tell you why. So um, how many of you guys uh, this morning were liking that song, singing that song, Echo, your love is holding on and it won't like it. How many guys are liking that song? Yeah, it was a good song. Yeah. Okay. I hate that song. <laughs> Can I be honest for a minute? It's a safe place, right? Okay. That song, that song's not my song. I mean, I'll give the song its proper credit. That song is catchy as I'll get out. I mean, you'll, you'll hear me humming it later today. Like, it gets stuck in your head. It's got, it's got good lyrics. The analogy, though, eh, doesn't really do too much for me. And so, um, so we were singing this song a couple weeks back. And, uh, like, I was singing it with my lips but I wasn't really thinking about the song because that song's not really like, it doesn't really connect to me. So I'm like singing with my lips, but I'm really thinking about that grocery list I need to make and how the lines are going to be really long at Wegmans because it's always mayhem on Sundays. Like I'm thinking about all those kinds of things. Nobody in here I know has ever done that. And certainly you're not doing that right now. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I'm, I'm in that headspace, and, and here's the thing, is I have access. I know what songs are coming next, so I'm like, oh, the next song is my jam. Like, that's where I'm really going to worship, and I did. I locked it in, and I was, you know, praising the name of the Lord. Like, I was all good, because that's my song, and that one resonates with my heart a lot more. And so um, it's so interesting. This is, this is like two or three weeks ago. We had sang that song, Echo, that we sang again today. And um, we repeat these songs, even that I don't like. Come on, church. And and here's the thing. I got to say, I got to give a shout out to the worship team. The worship team kills every, like, they're so good at it. Like, it's not about them. Like, they do an amazing job. But this song is just not my favorite song. And so I'm, I'm walking out. I'm taking my kids down to their classes right after worship when we release. And I'm walking down there. And this, uh, this younger dad um, is, is talking to me. And this is a, a young dad who he uh, found Jesus in this place. Um, in the last year or two, he gave his heart to Jesus and his whole life trajectory is changed. I think that just deserves a clap of praise for just a second for God's work that he is doing in people's hearts and lives right here in this place. But what he says to me is he's like, Jonathan, what was that second song we sang? I said, oh, it's Echo. And I tell him the artist and stuff. He's like, man, I love that song. <laughs> Of course you do. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm sitting there, and um, he, he says this. He doesn't just say he loves the song. He's like, that song just got me, like, locked in and focused and, like, ready for my week. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> um, but, no, honestly, it was at that moment where I felt that conviction where I felt like there's not something wrong with that song. There's something wrong with my heart. Like there, there's something I need to deal with here. And so I decided right out in that lobby out there, like that's not how I'm going to be anymore. Like if we're singing and we're declaring truth about who God is, I'm engaging with that. Like I'm, I'm all in. I want to be a man of God. I want to be a church that is pursuing him, that is boldly and loudly sharing the good news of who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I, I decided like that's, that's where I'm going. And so that was, a, that was a shift for me, and I'm working on that. God's always working on me. Always, always, always. My goodness, poor God. Um, but here's the thing that I also recognize about what can happen in worship, is that worship can change our hearts and change our lives. But the other thing is that it can actually start to affect others around us. Like sometimes I can be singing, and my brother or my sister that is struggling next to me, like I can be singing and declaring those truths even when for him or her, like it, it's too hard right now. Like it's too weighty. Like it, it's really challenging. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's like my faith can begin to start to spread out. Like for me, I want to be somebody who can affect the lives of other people through worship. Like that's, that's who I want to be. Worship does change my heart, but worship also isn't just about me and how I like to worship. Like, it isn't just about my preference of my song. Like, I love that third song, but I didn't love that second song. And, you know, like, is that, is that really what we're going to get hung up on? Like, that's the conversation we're going to have instead of talking about how good and great God is that he would send his son to die in our place? Like, 
I think sometimes we're missing the point. And I don't want to be a church who does that. And I don't want to be a person who does that. Okay, so back to the song Echo. I know we're, we're hanging on this song. This poor song is just getting a beat down today. Um, oh, and I do got to say this. This is a side caveat. I told Ben, I was like, hey, brother, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the church I hate your song. And he was like, oh, here's the thing. That's not, I don't even like that song that much. I was like, bro, you're dancing around up here. Like, you, I was like, you pretending? He's like, no, no, no. He's like, it's not fake. And I know Ben enough to know that this, this is true. He was like, this is a good song for our church. Like, I don't sing these songs for me. I sing them for us. Like, I lead our church. And I'm like, well, what, what do I have to stand on after that conversation I had out there? I'm like, we're singing Echo forever now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's the thing. There is one line in that song that I absolutely love. It says this. We all sing this together today. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. And I love that line because how often do I, do we, believe the lies inside of our own heads? Like that, that say that you are not good enough. That say, that say things like you aren't smart enough to start your own business. Like you aren't good enough to be a, a spouse. You aren't good enough to raise those kids. You're so, you're so stuck on your own mobile device. You're not even being present with the very gifts God has given to you. And we start just beating ourselves up and saying like you're not worthy of all these things. And instead of when my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. It turns our eyes heavenward. And, and here's the thing, is this is the same thing that's happening for Isaiah. He's beating himself up. He's saying, I am unworthy. I, my life is over. It is wrecked. It is ruined. But it wasn't. It wasn't for Isaiah. He was wrong. And, and I think my life is wrecked, ruined, over because of the dark things in my past or the things inside of my heart. And that's not right. I'm not defined by my works. I'm defined by the work of the cross. Amen? Amen. So I think that this is so encouraging for us because this is what worship does. Worship reorients our mind to what is actually true about God, what is actually true about others and myself. And worship wrecks our false thinking. It just destroys it like with a machete, just chopping it down, slays it. And so this is why we worship. This is why. It wrecks that false thinking. It doesn't say we are just defined by our lowest moment, even when culture tries to tell us that that's who we are and what we're defined by. But it gets even better, church. This is what's so good about who God is and about his word. We read on into verse 8. Um, it, it, says, it says this. It says, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? God talking to Isaiah. And Isaiah says to him, Here am I, send me. Now, it's, it's right out of being convicted of his own sin, thinking his whole life is over, where God actually comes and meets with Isaiah directly. Like, he's in his lowest broken spot, and that's where God comes in and invades. And not just meets with him, but God actually starts to show Isaiah, give him an opportunity to show him this is what your, your God-given purpose is for. And this is what happens when we worship, is that worship reveals our mission. Worship reveals our purpose. Like this is what worship does. It, it, worship shows us our calling. And we have a very clear mission as followers of Jesus. It, it is really clear for us what it is that we are supposed to do. Like we're supposed to go, make disciples, spread God's love everywhere you go. Be a light in the darkness. Pray for the prosperity of your city. Like, be worshipers. Like, that is where we are going to find what it is that we have been called to do. God's already shown us. We work not unto man, but as unto God. Like, this is, this is how we do things as followers of Jesus. And I just, I just feel like as a church, there's so much exciting work for us ahead that if we live on mission, can be accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's like there are souls that need saved. There are people that are hurting. There's a broken community who is longing and looking for God, whether they recognize it or not. And when we start to live on mission through spending time with God, 
Like, that is where things begin to change. The atmosphere doesn't stay the same. Now, maybe you're here today. How may, or let me ask this a question. How many of you have ever, like, prayed the prayer, God, would you just show me what my calling is, my purpose, or, like, longing for that? Like, I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've, like, feel like I've prayed that so many times in my heart and in my life. And I feel like God has shown me so much already about what my purpose is broadly. But sometimes we want to get real specific with it. Like, am I supposed to go to Applebee's or Chili's for lunch? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't know that God really, I don't know that he's like that invested. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but um, I would, don't go to either of those, by the way. I mean, get something better. Um, <laughs> Now, now you are thinking about food. I told you already, you're not supposed to be thinking about food. You're supposed to be thinking about the word of God. Okay, sorry to tempt you. Okay, but here's the thing for Isaiah. Is that for Isaiah, he actually gets his direct word from God about what it is that he is supposed to do and then responds to that when he spends time in the presence of God. That's where God speaks to him and says, who will go? Who will send? And Isaiah says, here am I. I'm available, Lord. But you know what he did first, before he found that out? He spent time with the Lord. That's where he figured that out. And did you know that God has a calling just for you? Like, he has known about you since before the beginning of time. Like, time doesn't exist for God, which I still can't wrap my mind around. But that God would, would actually choose to create you, that you have been made with a purpose and for a destiny. The God of the universe cares so much about your heart and your soul that he would do that and give that to you. I think that's unbelievable. I think that's amazing. I think that's really encouraging. Now, there's one more thing I want to tell you guys about worship, and it's back in verses 6 and 7. And it's, you remember the, the seraphim, the angel's flying around. He's got his six wings going on. And he gets the live coal off of the altar. And from there, he flies it over and he touches Isaiah's mouth with it. And this is where, you know, Isaiah realizes his, I'm a man of unclean lips, right after this. And I love what it says. See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. I just think for Isaiah, this had to be quite the remarkable experience. Like, that's a supernatural experience with God that, that he gets to have. And I don't know about you, but so often I'm like, man, I just wish I could get that really crazy good God story where, like, God does something so amazing and supernatural that, like, it would just make me believe so much more. Like somebody over here breaks their leg and we all pray for them and then zoop, legs all good. Like, and we're like, yes, God, like that would be awesome, wouldn't that? I would, I would love to see that. And, and God can do that. And I always think like, man, that would make me just believe so much more. But the thing about it is, I look at the lives of the disciples, the ones who walked with Jesus day by day, every day, saw him do literally countless miracles over and over, and when they come to come kill Jesus, guess who scattered and guess whose faith was shaken? And I don't think I'm, I'm so much different than any of the other disciples on that. Like, I think that would encourage my faith, and I think I'd tell that story, and I think, but I don't think that ultimately that would be the thing that would change my life. And I think for us, we're, sometimes we're, we're waiting for that God moment where we see something supernatural happen. But here's the thing. For Isaiah, he had to experience forgiveness in one way. And, but, but 783 years later, after Isaiah pens these words, there was somebody else who would leave his heavenly throne and who, who would come back to die for you, go to the cross, die and rise again. There is a miracle that has already happened, and his name is Jesus. See, we're, we're waiting on the, these hot coals, like some crazy story to happen, when we have access to the greatest miracle of all time, a God who would die for you and forgive your sins. Like, our guilt has been taken away. Our sin is atoned for by the blood of Jesus. Amen? And I think for us, we've got to transfix our eyes on him. 
Like, he has got to be the one that we worship. He is the one that we transfix our eyes on. And it's through spending time with him that that's where our mission, our calling is revealed to us. That is where we realize that I'm not bound by the shame and the guilt of my past, but instead I have been forgiven so I can walk forgiven. That is the God that we worship. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite you just to close your eyes because I want us to, to, to take a moment to think about this and to reflect on this and to just spend a moment with Jesus. Do you realize that, that Jesus loves you just as you are? He knows everything about you, everything that you've done, and he still loves you. So maybe for today, when you think about what is God calling me to, to, to take as my next step? Maybe for you, it's, it's what we talked about at the beginning, that there's this just deep sadness or there's just been this chaos in your life, and it is just weighing you down. I just want to start by saying I'm sorry that you are experiencing that, that you've got a God who, who sees you, who weeps with you, who doesn't leave you alone. And I, I just want to invite you, if you're in that space, to pray to Jesus and just even ask him to help you worship, even when it's just so, so difficult right now. Or maybe for you, it's that you as we were talking about the, the sin, like maybe there was something that was, was on your heart and on your mind. Where you're thinking, no, I've, I've got this in my own self. And maybe for you, it's, it's, it's not about just focusing in on trying harder to try to, to try to conquer that sin, but maybe for you, it's actually accepting God's forgiveness, leaning more into him and who he is, falling more in love with Jesus. Maybe that's your step. Or, or maybe for you, it's about just push, putting your eyes heavenward and saying, I want to live on mission. Like I've been distracted by a lot of other things, maybe even good things. But now today, I choose to make Jesus my pursuit because I believe he is real. I believe he is true and I believe he is good. So he is the one I am going after. I don't know what the Lord is calling you today, but I just invite you, just take a moment, 30 seconds, you and Jesus, talk to him. He is listening. God, would you meet with our hearts? We need you, Jesus. We, we, we just can't do this on our own. Like we've tried for so long. So this morning, we just surrender it to you. We orient our hearts towards you. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to help change our hearts, to reorient them back towards you. So would you help us, God? We need you, Jesus. And all who agree with that prayer said, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing now and we're going to declare. And I want, us, I want us to boldly sing this out. That there is one name above them all, the name above all names, Jesus. Would you sing this with me, church? Come on, let's sing.